In the church you'll find a lot of people who profess to be born again. Please, even if they, some of them have even been baptized through, you know, the water. They confess with their mouth, but they're still not born again. Because Satan's nature comes out and you can see it. By the fruit you will know them. Good morning and welcome to our family, Trinity International, our members, our patrons all over the world. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. Thank you for joining me this morning and thank you for being faithful with your giving towards the Lord. It helps me tremendously to do the work that we do. May God bless you and thank you. Um, last week, listen, we're going to have uh, a terrific journey this morning understanding where we are in the end of days and uh, it might be a long ride but I want you to pay very careful attention to details that I'm sharing with you but in order you know sometimes we have people that join us for the first time we don't want them to be lost sometimes um, we need them to engage so I'm going to set the platform for you briefly that which I started last week. But uh, hopefully, time permitting, I'm going to be able to complete uh, the next segment. But let's recap from what we learned last week. We learned last week that pride is the primordial sin. That uh, Lucifer, uh, he was the first angel. I think you, you know that by now from what I've been teaching you. He was the first angel that God made and he felt special. But when God decided to create Adam in his image, uh, Lucifer became jealous or envious. That envy resulted in pride because God asked the archangel Michael to get all the angels to bow their knees to God's likeness, Adam. And we know that Lucifer and many of the angels under his command refused because of pride. They uh, spoke to God or Michael and said, listen, we were first, I was God's favorite and I am superior to this man. How can I bow my And for that sake, for the sake of envy of who Adam was and the pride that crept into his heart, he decided that he wanted to overthrow God and take the reins. And you know, it's just ludicrous for any creature, God says he's wise, but really, to, to want to overtake the creator. A creature wanted to overtake a creator. That just doesn't make any logical sense. Anyway, that was the primordial sin, pride. Came in because of his enviousness of Adam. Now, that same pride, he wanted to have a relationship with Eve. And uh, it wasn't a physical relationship. When he spoke words, I taught you much about this frequencies and all these things. But when he spoke words, his words were, sounded sweet and attractive to Eve. Don't you want to be like God? If you eat of this fruit, you will be like God. That was a sense of pride to lift Eve up to a higher standard. That looked enticing to her. Besides the fruit looked good to eat. And so these words that crept into Eve was the birth 
place the conception of evil spirits, demons that belong to this age. Demons that were created after Adam and Eve. In fact, Eve was the mother of these demons simply by allowing Satan's words to impregnate her DNA, to be absorbed inside of her. Now, you, you remember I taught you some time ago about a word in Hebrew. That word is yada. Now, when we look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, I'm going to read that to you, but we're going to read it from the original Hebrew. And it says, And Adam knew Eve. Now, that word yada has a special meaning. Now, in this sense, that word new meant impregnate. Um, and this word allowed Eve to conceive. And the child was Cain. Adam knew Eve and she conceived Cain. Now, that word new was a euphemistic way of saying Adam impregnated Eve or had relations, intimate relations with. Now, this same word is attributed to when Satan spoke to Eve, she conceived because he impregnated. What did he impregnate? He impregnated her character, her DNA. Now, I taught you this many times. This concept is pivotal to salvation, to saving your spirit, the one that God made. Your DNA houses everything about you, you, your character, your spirit. That's the house in which your spirit lives. If you take a sample of that DNA, you can create another you with all your physical characteristics and all your uh, unseen characteristics, the, your habits, your tendencies, your likes, all those things are in coded form inside your DNA. And if you have a child, you know this, that those characteristics become part and parcel of your child's DNA. Some characteristics appear in your children, in your son, some appear in your daughter, but all your characteristics are in them both. It's just that some lay dormant and others manifest. But in their children, your son's child, some characteristics that were quite in him now start to show up. But one way or the other, Everything about you gets transferred to the next generation because there was an impregnation of two, uh, of one into another. Now, the, imp the character of Satan, the primordial nature of Satan, his spirit, his character, when his words impregnated, when he knew Eve, we knew, we know that he knew her. Because she acted on his words. It means that his nature impregnated her DNA. Went right into her character. And changed it to produce a new character. So children were born, spiritually speaking, into Eve. Now Eve was no, because she allowed herself to be impregnated, her own character... It's not, now listen very carefully to me. It's not that she produced children. She became a new creature. I hope you're getting this. She is now unlike what God made her. Her nature changed 
to include the nature of the father that spoke into her in that garden. The father meaning the devil. So her spirit now is now a child of the devil. And hence when Jesus was speaking, he was calling children of the devil. Uh, so we'll get to that in a moment. But I hope you get this concept. Eve is no longer Eve. The way that God made her. Her character has been transformed into the nature of Satan. And those are the children of Satan. So inside of Eve is the children. She is now a child of the devil. In other words. And for that reason God couldn't commune with her or her husband. Because both of them did the same thing. Now. We learned last week from Greek mythology that, uh, we'll read it again quickly, uh, Phytonos or Pythonos, however you say it, or sometimes zealous, jealous we get from, was the personification of jealousy and envy. We learned also that his female counterpart was Nemesis, that's revenge. According to Irenaeus, that's Gnostics now, or very uh, learned ancient scholars, these writings were found together with the biblical, the things that are in the Bible in Nagamadi um, uh, caves. So they are authentic from ancient Gnostics. Believe that the first angel, Lucifer, and Othadia, that means Eve, because they say she had the audacity to, to listen to, uh, to disobey God, also known as Archon. So what they're saying is Eve's new name. Because her character changed into a new creature, and I'm saying new creature reservedly because that new creature, envy or pride, it, it's encompassed into one. That new person, envy, that's a new person now. That's a new character. It produces children. And in other words, it has different uh, natures that come from that one aspect of pride and these and this whole the collection together is known as Archon so together all the children that came out of or oh, that that are Eve now is known as the Archon Archon means uh, the first spirits of this age and these were who they were. Kakya. In English that means wickedness. So out of Eve's nature now comes wickedness. Zealous. That's emulation. We'll get to that in time. Phthonos. Envy. Uh, Erinus. Fury. And epithemia. Lust. So these this is the nature now, the new nature of Eve. This is who she is. And I shared with you last week. From all the children that she bore, especially the first one we read last week, Cain. He had envy. He was jealous over God favoring his brother's offering. And that led to him having fury. Maybe things like lust, emulation and things were out, not in his, didn't manifest in his life. Now it all went down the line even up till today. That nature is the children of the devil. It's the prince of darkness, the archon. Collectively the archon is known as the prince of darkness. The kingdom of the prince of darkness. Prince means first one. First one of this age. This is the first spirit created in the age of a human. I hope everything is clear. Now you'll remember what they were trying to do a couple of years ago and obviously still going on. They created this new science and we learnt about it in quite some detail. The CRISPR-Cas9 uh, editing. And what they wanted to do was yada, impregnate every human with the genes of another creature. That's how 
Pope's work. And uh, it wasn't just for the human to get used to that uh, that disease and learn, help your body to fight it. No, they wanted to take part of that, the nature of that creature, that bug, I'm using those terms loosely. They wanted to take part of that and cut your character, your DNA and plant something inside. In other words, that person who's taken the authentic poke they are now a new creature, like how Eve. And in that new creature is, obviously, you not like the way God intended. Especially those who have claimed to be born again. They no longer the way that God intended. If they've taken the authentic one. There are many who has not taken for logistical reasons, they couldn't do the uh, technology in all the pokes. So what they wanted to do was do the same thing the father of lies did in the garden. He fathered the archon, the prince of darkness, kingdom of demons, of characters. And he didn't just create them loosely, he made man into his character. Now we're going to confirm this with Wikipedia. Archons, we learned, is the builders of the physical universe. In other words, because they are man now, and I'm saying that also very loosely, their nature is man, the new man that he created in the garden, the devil. That new man, these people, his people now, his children now, are the builders of the universe, of the physical world rather. And so that's what we see. In Manichaeism, the archons are the rulers of a realm within the kingdom of darkness, who together make up the prince of darkness. Here we confirm. Now, these are the rulers, the, the, the firstborn princes of this age. You remember... We, we learned when, when, we was, when Paul spoke to us in the book of Ephesians and he warned us. We, we, we went through all most of this last week, but I'm just bringing you up to speed. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the powers. In other words, principalities means first ones, princes of, of this kingdom, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age. Because this, this Eve now, and all the children she made, up including even till now, all of them have the nature of their father, the devil. And that's why Jesus said to them, you are like your father, the devil. It's not that they were acting like him, they had his nature inside of them. I hope you're getting this. And uh, against spiritual hosts, of wickedness in heavenly places. So in a realm that you cannot see with your eye, these spirits roam, but they are man. They don't possess man. Oh man, I hope you're getting this. This is different from demonic possession. This is man itself being demonic. They're not possessed with another spirit living in their body. These is, this is the nature of the new man that Satan created in Eve. These are no longer the children of God. Now the only way for you to change or rechange that nature into God's original design, remove the curse of this dark force that has overtaken and become a new creature is through the blood of Jesus. You need to be born again, removing the old nature and replacing it with the new nature. Hence, that was what the death on Calvary was for. Until that time, even though people may have good natures, do good things, until that time, 
they are in the nature and form of their second father, the devil. You cannot be a new creature as God made you unless you are born again. We see this in the book of 2 Corinthians when Paul spoke to us and he said, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. So, you know, when you look at a person, you don't really see a behavior of evil because someone is possessed. Someone who isn't blood washed and is a new creature, they are the children of the devil. I hope this is getting through to you. I'm going to take you on a further journey now to see some of the natures of these characteristics of Eve's children. And I say Eve's children, I mean every one of us that came out from there. Um, we'll go to the ancient history, the time around where Jesus came on the earth. And I'm going to ha put something up on your screen and I want you to look at it so that you understand the history. There was a man called Herod the Great. He was the man whose name all the other Herods took. That's like a surname. And we're going to read about him in the book of Matthew, the massacre of the innocents. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under. We can see now one of the characteristics of this new creature Herod. And when I say new creature, I mean the creature that Lucifer created when he impregnated Eve. Eve became a new creature. A different creature. That same different creature was Herod. And everybody else. But I want you to, I want you to see that one of the natures of this new creature is wickedness. You can just quickly look at Ephesians. You'll see wickedness highlighted there. Ephesians 6.12 And if we look at the original quote that when we started off, we said that the children of the Archon, Kakya, wickedness. We can see this as one of the characteristics of this new creature, Eve and her children and all her children up until now. Now this was the Herod who was alive and was warned that Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews, was going to be born. So he decided in his wickedness character to kill every male child. That's the man. Then we look at Acts chapter 25 verse 23. So the next day when Agrippa, this was Herod Agrippa II. If we look at that diagram again. We can see who this Herod Agrippa is and where he's placed. He's the great grandson of Herod the Great. Right at the bottom near Bernice. Uh, let's read that. So the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city at Festus, commanded, command Paul was brought in. Now what you don't know was that this man, Herod Agrippa, if you look at the diagram again, his sibling was Bernice. In other words, that was his sister. The other sister was Drusilla. He, Agrippa, married Bernice, his own sister. And Bernice before that was married to her uncle. And then she married her own brother. And so these two were husband and wife traveling together. And they made Paul appear before them. In the time of Acts, they arrested Paul and he appeared before them, before he went to Rome. 
we can see the fact that Paul was brought before them and arrested for preaching the gospel. We can see wickedness. We can also see one of the other characteristics, lust. And if we go back to the original archons, we can see one of the children there is epithemia, which is lust. One of the characteristics of a child of Satan. Now, this was a man, Agrippa II. When you, when you think of wickedness, one of the characteristics of a child of Satan, it, it, you can't get worse than this. This is the man who ordered that Christians be burnt at the stake. And they used to put them, I taught you this before, in a bronze bull. And they pushed the Christians inside that bull and lit a fire underneath it, cooking them alive inside. The closest we can come to understanding what this might be like is what I'm going to show you next. It's from a movie clip. But please, if you're sensitive, do not watch this next couple of minutes. Just view it so that you can have an idea. Is what wickedness was like now it might surprise you maybe it won't but the Apostle Paul before he became Paul was Saul and this Saul was part and parcel of this group of people who did the same thing to Christians Paul when he was Saul put Christians inside these bulls like that and cook them alive. And this is why Peter, when God saved Paul, Lord, how can you do that? This man killed your children. But you see, there came a point when Paul, Saul was no more longer Saul, and God gave him a new creature inside. He made him into a new creature. The old child of Satan died. And the new child of God was born. So Saul became Paul. God even gave him a new name. He's saying now you're a new person again. You're not a child of Satan again. Your character has been cleaned. I just want to show you the transformation of people. They can be one nature, nature of the devil. And the moment they, they washed with the blood of Jesus and God saves you. All the nature of Satan disappears. You cannot be the same old, old you again. Like how the devil made Eve's children to be. Mm -mm. But even after you're born again, the devil will still try and yada you so he can change your nature back. And many times he succeeds. Now, in this region that we call Israel today, we read about... What was happening during the time of Jesus? Romans 16, 11 tells us, Salute Herodian, my kinsmen. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. This is Paul greeting his family members, the Herodians. In other words, from the region of Herod, so, Paul, although he was a Pharisee, he was a Herodian. And you can see that Herodians, who was Edomites, the children of Esau, mixed and mingled with the Pharisees. We'll see this in Mark chapter 3 verse 6. Then the Pharisees went out. And immediately plotted with the Herodians against him, who? Jesus, 
how they might destroy him. So, when they were plotting against Jesus, it was who? The Edomites. The Herodians that were Edomites. Herod was an Edomite. And all the clans that lived there were Edomites in that region. Today it's known as Israel. And a little bit further up, living in the area of Jerusalem were the Pharisees. But these Pharisees were planted to, to run the Jerusalem temple. They were actually secret Edomites. In other words, children, you know we heard Klaus Schwab once saying, if we have time in this video to play it for you while I'm speaking to you. He said that he infiltrated and infiltrates the cabinets in many countries so that the decisions they make fall in line with their agenda. But um, what we are very proud of now is a young generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Pres of uh, Argentina and so on, so that we penetrate the cabinets. So yesterday I was at a, rece at a reception for Prime Minister Trudeau and I would know that half of this cabinet or even more half of, uh, half of this cabinet are for our uh, actually young global leaders of the world economy right. forum. And that's true in Argentina too. Wow. Yeah. Sorry. That's true in Argentina as well. It's true in Argentina and uh, it's true in France now. Mm -hmm. I may be Now, they've been doing that for centuries because the decisions that the Edomites wanted to make were planted in the temple priests so that they can make the decision to kill Jesus. Because who were they? If you're not blood washed, saved and born again, you are a child of the devil. That's who, that, that is the explanation of the old nature. And remember, I'm telling you once again, you're not possessed with an evil spirit. You are that spirit. Because your nature had been changed. I hope you're understanding this and you'll understand even better when I explain to you a little bit further about Jesus' words to certain people. Then we get Herod Antipas. If we go back to the diagram and look at who these people were. This was a, one of the Herods. Let's read it in Mark 6. But when Herod heard, he said, this is John whom I beheaded. Has he, he has been raised from the dead, for he, Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. So there's another, he married his brother's wife, and you'll remember, once John the Baptist was baptizing people, and he turned and he looked and he saw this man, Herod uh, Antipas, walking in his chariot, going past with his wife, who was actually his brother Philip's wife. And as they were going past, uh, he shouted at this man and embarrassed him. And the wife got embarrassed. And you'll remember the story, she asked for his head, and he had the head cut. His lustful spirit, nature rather, <clears throat> and his wickedness nature are demonstrated. And we know that Herod was born in southern Palestine. His father Antipater was an Edomite, a Semitic people. Now, Semitic is in the sense that they are Jewish and in the sense that they are children of Abraham and Isaac. But they are not Semitic being the children of Judah, that from which Jesus came. They are children of the twin brother Esau and hence they were called Edomites, but they called themselves Jews. Semite means Jew. So a Jewish Edomite. Now these are the ones, a Jewish Edomites, that are occupying the land that we know today as Israel. Of course there might be real Jews in and around everywhere, not that they are extinct, 
but predominantly the leadership and most of the people living there have the same nature as the Herodians. Wickedness, lust and so forth and so, all the natures of the child of a child of Satan. Now these are the people that Christians are convinced that they should be standing up for. That's because you see when you have no knowledge you can perish. Those were the words that prophets spoke to us that we take so lightly and even apply it in the wrong circumstances. Because you don't understand things. And this is why you have to thank God that he sent you to be under a ministry that can share with you truth that can open your eyes because one wrong step and it could cost you salvation and don't take that lightly. And I pray those who are even not under our covering that you find the shepherds and they must be, God must have them all over the place. That you have found a shepherd who can speak truth to you so that the devil cannot mislead you. But you can see how they dress this thing up. Most of the preachers take the Old Testament prophets, Old Testament prophets, and they, you know, they quote, Israel can never be defeated. I will raise up a standard to come against the enemies of Israel. You know who they were talking about? They were talking about the rebellion that was taking place that during the time and just before Jesus arrived. They were talking about the overthrow of Israel prior to the coming of Jesus. They were talking about the Babylonians and the Persians and those people who were coming up against the true Israel. Not these Edomites that are sitting there. So when they use these Old Testament quotes, it looks very proper. You know, they are the children of God. You know, we have to stand up for them. No matter what, we must hold them up in prayer. And when you support the children of darkness, don't expect God to salute you. Because he says, you know how you'll know them? By their fruit. What that nature produces, you can see lust, wickedness, and you know, over the weeks now, there's images that we see of what they're doing to innocent people. People that are not involved in any attacks against them. What they're doing is a sin of very bad proportions. And you can see Herodian nature coming out. That's why I showed you the Herod character. You can see that nature coming out. And if you can't see the fruit of darkness there, then I'm afraid there's no excuse for your ignorance. You know, I shared with you this, that whatever a creature is made from, he has to stay attached to it to survive. For example, fish was made from the sea, of the sea, I shared with you prepositions. And if you take a fish out of the environment from which it source, it will die. If you take tree out of the ground from where it was born, it dies. If you take uh, animals from the ground, stop it from eating, stop it from grazing, walking, it will die. If you take a star out of the atmosphere above in the heavens and you bring it to an earthly atmosphere, it will disintegrate and die. So it, every creature of God has to remain attached to its source. And for example, the human is the only one who has two sources. One is the earth, so we have to eat, we have to drink water, we have to survive. The other is God, so we have to remain attached to God. But who? The nature that God made. So when you're born again and you've got a new nature... That new nature must be attached to God at all times. Feed from him. That's why listening to his words uh, encourages you. It feeds you. It's like when you, when, you, when you thirst and you drink that water, it, it gives you another week to go. Another thing to contemplate, to feed and constantly grow. But it doesn't, listen, 
if Satan is the father, the source of the new, and I say new, I need you to know that it's the recreated Eve that he created. He was that source. So if you get somebody who is not born again, those people in order for the evil to, to live, it has to be attached to the source. I hope you're getting this. If Satan made them, in other words, he gave them the new nature. Their new nature, their corrupt nature, I should say, maybe I'll use that term, that corrupt nature, in order for it to live, it must remain attached to its source, which is Satan. So Satan has to feed it, Satan has to nurture it, for it to stay sustained. If Satan doesn't nurture it, it can also die. And for this reason, Satan created platforms like churches and he puts false prophets there so that the words they can speak, they are his children, false prophets. The devil's children. And so when they speak his words, it feeds their nature within those people. And his spirit stays alive. Oh, I hope you're getting this. This is why Jesus warned us. In the end, I'm going, my gospel is going to be preached everywhere. My good news. So in order to combat that, the devil has to raise up many prophets in the last days so that he can feed his nature in the people. Many of them being so-called Christian. This is a warning to beware and aware of what Jesus... You see, he, they wouldn't have taken time to warn us about this. If it wasn't life or death for you. Do you know before Peter was saved and all the apostles. You know what Jesus called him. Let's look Matthew 6. But he turned and said to Peter. Get behind me Satan. Because before he was born again. Peter's spirit was a child of Satan. I hope you're understanding the nature of what I'm saying. Peter, his character, because he came from Eve, and Eve was already changed. Before he was born again, he was a child of Satan. So God spoke to him and said, Satan, this is who you are. Every one of them was Satan. That's why he said, you are of the, your father the devil. He spoke to believers. Because why? They were not changed at that time. There was no renewal of the spirit at that time. The spirit only got renewed when Jesus' blood was shed. So when you believe in him, you become a new creature. You're no longer a child of Satan. Until then, you'll always be looking to feed from your father, the devil. Until new day is born, your, 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 your spirit is born again. Now, you know, in the church, and I'm, you know, I've been addressing Christians for these last few weeks. In the church, you'll find a lot of people who profess to be born again. Please, even if they, some of them have even been baptized through, you know, the water. They confess with their mouth, but they're still not born again. Because Satan's nature comes out and you can see it. By the fruit, you will know them. And, you know, when we had, this, you know, there's a, there's a gift God gave Nash and I that uh, we treasure so much and that gift is not not being proud N having humility being satisfied with what we have if we have we have we don't have we don't have you know when we started off we had uh, we had nothing you know absolutely nothing there were times when Nash, 
was too weird. We had Nicole at that stage, but she had clothes that were old. And she used to go to her family's house, walking sometimes because I was at work. And they would look at her <clears throat> and tell her, but why are you wearing old clothes? They, they told her that. And she was sharing with me just recently that it didn't bother her one bit that they were speaking about her. Because if, you said Satan tells his children to bother you. Because they recognize who you are. So they, they use their tactics to bother you. Because what they want to interfere with, your pride. They want you to look small. They, they want you to feel inferior. They want you to be embarrassed. And for some reason she was not embarrassed. She felt nothing. Even when she decided to marry me, I was nothing. Our family was nothing. My father was nothing. My mother, we were living in an outbuilding. We hardly had furniture. But she, she came and was prepared to build a life with me with nothing. And when she started off, when we, we had, you know, we had never had furniture for the first, we never had a city for the first 11 years of our marriage. We, we never had a lounge suite. We didn't know what it was to take a trolley and to go shopping to buy groceries for the month. We didn't know what it was like until about 11 years into our, into our marriage. We, we, we had no idea, you know, and so... You know, during when we started church and it was in a few years in, we had some very wealthy people who joined the ministry. And they lived in a posh house. I'm talking about one particular couple. Everything was there. And uh, the, once we went, we had a fundraiser. I'm just sharing with you some things. We had a fundraiser. And uh, Nash is a very down-to-earth person. She's very straightforward. But she doesn't mind getting her hand dirty. And so she was wearing not so glamorous outfit at this banquet. And she was actually serving at the table and so selling some things. I'm not sure what it exactly was, but she was engaging with the people. And this couple, the wife was dolled up like she was the pastor's wife. And she actually used these words, why are you dressed like that and why are you serving the people? Can you not have a better dress to wear? That too didn't bother Nash at all. And then when we moved to this new place, this, we were in a, a commercial building and the landlord treated us poorly. Our stuff got wet because he didn't... Anyway, it was a long story, but we had to move into a house, a, a normal house. And we, in one week, we had to break the walls and we had to squash inside this one building. This is the building we are in at the moment. And I had to do an, a quick extension, but while that extension was going on, there was mud everywhere. People had to step on things and come inside. And I can tell you, many stayed with me, which means that image didn't bother them. But some image was very important. They didn't want to get their clothes soaked or muddy. No, no. They preferred a nice setting rather than a good word. So anyway, there were, came a time when this uh, one, the, the husband of this rich couple now, he was, the service was on, I'm in the service. He, call, he, call, he stood outside with his vehicle. And he called some of the so-called leaders outside to have a meeting with them about how I can take this place, it's such dilapidated area, how can we bring ourselves and lower ourselves to that standard. You see, pride and envy, pride never bothered me. Entitlement didn't bother. Lord, I'm doing your work, can't you give me a decent... I didn't bother. I can wear the cheap, you know, when I was a pastor in the old church, uh, the, I, I had no money. I used to wear one tie, old tie. And one, the pastor's son actually said, can't he get a better tie? You know, and it, listen, it didn't bother me. 
that he made me look small in people's eyes. No, it didn't bother me. It's something I have that I am not ashamed. I have no feeling of entitlement or pride. It's like the devil's character was not in me the moment I gave my life to Jesus. It's like something clicked and changed in me that I have none of it. I can walk Take a taxi which I had to at a certain time in our ministry. Sit amongst the people. Even when it comes to relating to people. You have my WhatsApp number on your screen. Sometimes ordinary people from another part of the world need to reach me. I am a shepherd. I need to be there as long as I can. If I can physically handle it, I will. But... If you go to, you see, I don't mind that. I don't mind coming down because that's who God, that's where God wants his shepherds to be. On the ground, being accessible so that people can be helped. You know this pride thing? It didn't bother me no matter who. That couple is no longer because I removed them. After noticing too much of the devil's children behavior. Giving people a chance is one thing. But when you have them alongside you. You cannot. So I had to remove them. And you know what got people. What probably. They had everything. Money. Glitz. Glamour. But you know what they didn't have? Peace. You see when they look at us. It's like there's a light. There's a relationship that people want to have that they can't have. How are you like that? And sometimes when you are a devil's child, it comes out in a way that you can't explain. It's like you, you don't know how to react to it because you want something. And this couple never had peace. There was always suspicion of, of extramarital affairs. There was suspicion of different things. I'm not going to get into it, but but they wanted and yearned for something that they saw. The closeness uh, between Nash and I. The, it's like, they, what? They have nothing. Why do they, how do they have this, this thing that we want? They don't, it's not a spoken thing. It's something that they feel. And they can't understand and it causes frustration. And this is what happens in your life. People look at you and they get frustrated. You might have, you might not have anything. But, but you know, Nash was telling me there was an elderly lady that lived in her district when she was about nine or ten years old. All her family and all the other neighbors around were non-believers. They were not Christian. And this one old lady was a sister was living in her sister's house. She was not, uh, she, she had no husband, she had no work. She used to wash people's clothes, uh, the neighbor's clothes. That's how she used to make a living. But amongst everybody, she was the Christian. And she says when, this, you know, she was nine years old, but when she looked at this lady dressing up with a sari, old sari, but she looked neat. There was something about her that Nash said I liked. I don't know what it was. Her sister used to abuse her and treat her like a Cinderella story. Wash the clothes, cook the food, look after everybody. But they treated her very badly. And all the neighbors looked down on her because she was a Christian. But she had her head up high. And it seemed like, you know, at nine years old, it seemed like, like nothing bothered her and admired her. And that time Nash wasn't a Christian. Wasn't saved. But she says, I looked at this lady, there was a light in her. And I think the other people got jealous of what she had. Because the sister used to wear very expensive jewelry and, and she never, in Nash's eyes, she never looked as smart as the poor lady, as a poor sister. And she says, you know, it just brings back to memory how, how the light of God shines in you that even others who are not Christians can see. So you, if you have humility, beloved, you are in you are a child of God. So it doesn't matter what you have or you, what you don't have. You can have a lot of things and still have the light of God shine in you. I'm not saying that 
if you have, you don't, you don't have the light. I'm just showing you that sometimes you can have money and still be humble. And that's the most beautiful thing of the children of God. They can be both. But it doesn't mean if you don't have anything, you have to feel shy about it. You can lose. You know, sometimes God wants to teach certain people a lesson. And they remove certain things from their lives. And you know when people sing this song, mold me and shape me, Lord. And so when God is busy molding, sometimes you, you get depressed. And you say, no, God's favor is not on me. No, he's molding you. You said mold me. Because God wants to remove certain characteristics, certain, certain attributes that you've been picking up. And, and so, so sometimes in different ways he molds you. And I want you to be acceptable. Lord, no matter what you do, Lord, I am in your hands. And God has molded me, listen to me, both of us, for, for many, many years. And the Lord said, I hope you finish molding now, Lord. Um, but we had to go with the flow. If it happens, it happens. It doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Everything according to your will, Lord. I have no entitlement. I don't feel because I'm doing your work, I, I, I am owed this by you. And that's what I want to instill in you. So that God looks at you and he gets proud, man. Even Paul, with all the work that he did, he said, my body has been broken now. I've done everything. I hope, Lord, you are happy with me. And this is where I want you. If we go back and look at the Wikipedia article where we saw the five children of Satan from pride, from the archons, we look at the other one, it's called emulation. This means following the crowd. You know when this poke thing came out and the media was saying that you need to follow the, you know, do what is right and follow everything. And, and lots of Christians went with the flow. It's called emulation. When, when churches started to open, everybody said, right, that's the way we'll do what other, other Christian people are doing. Everything that happens, we'll do what other people are doing. They praying and falling down, we too will do the same thing. Anything. And you'll find that even when this war took place, we support Israel. And so you see, when you, when you, when you have the spirit of, of darkness, when you are the spirit of darkness, child of Satan, you go with the flow always. And you notice Jesus never went with the flow. He always went opposite to the flow. Not Purposely, but because the flow is always in the direction of darkness. And this is what and who I am. We are still online. But other people have opened, but other people are doing this. I don't do what other people do. Emulation, following others, emulating them, behaving like them, is one of the characteristics of the prince of darkness, of the archons, one of the children's characteristics. So be careful. Don't let the masses lead your action. Don't necessarily do what everyone is doing. Because everyone is doing it. This pride sits in the heart of many people. This character. You know when you look at people who belong to these big, big churches. They can't help. But mention the name of the church they're going to. When you have a rich person, they normally choose the richest building to go to or the pastor with the biggest name who drives the best car. They want to be associated with prosperity and richness because of that same character of Satan, what it's called, pride. You'll notice and you ask them, Where the, where's your pastor? No, he's too busy to pray for me. Can you pray for me? Uh, you understand the nature and this needs to, you need to understand this all these children of Satan this is how they behave now listen I'm going to take you to one of the most interesting things we've come across that is now leading up to the end of days oh you got to take this the protocols of Zion I'm going to leave the first part but I'm going to read to you one section of the protocols of Zion it says our authority will be the crown of order and in that is included the whole happiness of man. The aureole of this authority will inspire, listen, a mystical bowing of the knee before it. 
and a reverent fear before it of all the peoples. True force makes no terms with any right, not even with that of God. None dare come near to it so as to take so much as a span from it away. I want you to notice a mystical bowing of a knee is going to take place. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 we read for a reason. Everything I'm doing is for a reason. Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ has come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. That's the apostasy. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is God or, what, or that is worshipped. So that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Revelation 13, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now we read this many times, but what does it have to do with what we're doing now? Now I'm going back to the protocols. You know, the protocols are the ones that are written by these Zionists, these Edomites, about what's going to happen in the end of days. Now let's read this part here. When the king of Israel sets up his sacred head, the crown offered him by Europe. And he will become patriarch of the world. The indispensable victims offered by him in consequence of their suitability will never reach the number of victims offered in the course of centuries by mania of magnificence. The emulation between the Goy governments. Our king will be constant, in constant communication with the peoples, making to them from the tribune speeches which fame will in the same hour distribute over all the world. I want you to take special note of the first sentence. When the king of Israel sets up his sacred head, the crown offered him by Europe. We read before that there's going to be a mystical bowing of a knee. And then a king of Israel, there is going to be an entity who we know as the Antichrist that's going to be risen in Israel. Hmm. Uh, listen, it's not Netanyahu. It's going to be risen in that land and people are going to bow to this thing. It's going to be the savior of the world and everybody is going to acknowledge it. It's going to be given, there's going to be a mystical bowing of the knee from Europe, the western countries. And they're going to make this new thing, this antichrist, the leader of the world. Right? Get that. Now I want you to see what, why is this thing that's this war happening so significant? I want you to see Watch this video. The visit by Israel, by presidents of two of the European Union's most prominent institute, in, institutions, comes six days after uh, Hamas carried out its surprise land, sea and air. European Commissioner, President Ursula von der Leyen, and European Parliament President Roberta Metzola. It's, it started. Then Prime Minister Sunak also arrived in Israel. What for? Then the Dutch Prime Minister comes to Israel. Then the French Prime Minister comes to Israel. Then the German Chancellor comes to Israel. There seems to be an entity, a mystical bowing of the knee. You see, you can make a phone call. You can say you support. You can do. What's the reason for these nincompoops 
to personally come and do a bowing of the knee. I mean, I didn't call them ninkam pups. The, the protocols called them ninkam. They called the leaders that they created in the end times ninkam pups. Now, let's take a new look at this journey. Revelation, what is this Antichrist? Revelation 13, the beast from the sea. Then stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. This is in Revelation 13. This is concerning the Antichrist. I want to show you an article confirming that there is a company called NVIDIA. It announces EOS, the world's fastest AI com supercomputer. Who are they building it for? Reuters tell us, NVIDIA to build Israel's supercomputer as AI demand soars. So who, are, who is NVIDIA building that supercomputer for? This was in fact last year now, that 2023, that they were announcing. I want you, th this computer program is called EOS. They announced EOS. It's part of the NVIDIA uh, program. Now I want, to, I want you to see what EOS means. Michael Janda uh, etymologizes Aphrodite's name as an epithet of EOS meaning she who rises from the foam from the ocean. Revelations tell us a beast rising up out of the sea. That's what EOS is. That's what it means. Any, any bells ringing at the moment? And it has a further meaning. Its powers, in other words, Eos's powers, the one that's rising out of the sea, the powers of Eos is identified as photokinesis, as the titaness of the dawn. Eos has divine authority and absolute control over the light. Wow. First, let's see who owns it. NVIDIA is owned by Vanguard Group. While its majority stakeholder is Vanguard Group. We know who they are, the Edomites. They are 100% owned by Edomites. And they are building a super AI computer. Uh, and it's coming for Israel. Now, this was last year. Now, we know something is there at the moment. That's calling the shots. Oh man, I'm going to share with you a revelation that might make you more sense by next week. But let's look at what NVIDIA means. In Latin, NVIDIA is the sense of envy. Highlight that. An intense gaze associated with malice and the evil eye. NVIDIA is also the Roman name for the ancient Greek titan deity Nemesis. We know Nemesis is the counterpart of Envy. Envy is called Nvidia. It is the evil eye we've been talking about for so long. So we know that there's something there that the European leaders are coming to bow to. And I don't think it's going to be long before these things are going to be revealed. This AI, this Antichrist is going to be revealed to the world. Just wait for it. Let's read the protocols again. The aureole of this authority will inspire a mystical bowing of the knee before it and a reverent fear before it of all peoples. When the king of Israel sets up his sacred head, the crown offered him by Europe, he will become patriarch of the world. So this new thing, this is new leader that's coming. This is the new savior of the world, not our savior their savior and that is the antichrist so i hope you're getting this full picture and i'm leading you to help you to understand what's going to unfold next follow me for that next week by the way we will serve communion to you next week sunday listen i've spoken to you some very deep things i want you to recognize that your own family member, people that you are very close to, they might be all around you. If there is no rebirth, you're not looking 
and talking to some people possessed by demons. You're talking to the children of Satan themselves. And some of them, in fact most of them, will try and belittle you by speaking about you, by undermining you, by making you feel small. It can even be the partners that you are with. And I want you to be watchful of these things. If you can't help being around them, I need you to rise above that because a child of God does not feel shame, does not feel entitled. And this is why they dragged Jesus down the streets naked because they wanted him to feel shame. This is why they spat on him because they wanted him to feel shame. They wanted him to have pride and he refused. They wanted this pride to birth anger in him so that he can become once again a child of Satan just like Eve and all the children from there. And the devil wants to do that to you. So no matter where the Lord has brought you, where you ended up in your life, how bad things might be, never feel shame. Never let people put you down. No matter how low you might be financially or any other way, no matter who, which relationship has broken, maybe you had a big wedding and you're frightened to call it off because it's pride now. It's what people will say. That's the reason why people stay and suffer for so long. The pride that they have prevents them from having peace. The pride of your parents that they put on you prevent you from being you. Because image is important to many people. Why did you marry that person with the low surname? Not like ours. And these image things you need to bring it down because they all created in this world because of the children of Satan. I don't know where you are in your personal life but never let the children of the devil get to you. That's who they are. I want to pray with you. Let's pray peace upon your life. Heavenly Father, your children go through many knocks to be molded. They rise and they fall. They go through trials and tribulations. All designed to mold and shape. To remove every character of darkness. Every temptation that is brought their way will be removed in the name of Jesus. They will have a resistance towards any temptation. Cover them all. Let them have humility in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Bless you, beloved. Have a beautiful week. I'll see you again next week. God bless.